Hi, my name is Anita Novak, and I'm the author of this book. Welcome to season 11 of Purposeful Empathy, a show that is dedicated to amplifying the voices of people from across the globe who understand that the world needs more empathy and are doing something about it. Thanks for watching. Enjoy the show. Welcome to a new episode of Purposeful Empathy. Today I am joined by Jennifer Lonergan, who is the founder and executive director of Artistry Sud, which is an organization that provides micro-entrepreneurship and leadership training to women in low-income countries with the goal of empowering them to create sustainable livelihoods and affect change in their families and communities. Armed with a PhD in history, she is also a fellow of the Miller Center for Social Entrepreneurship and was on faculty with the Master of Social Impact program at Claremont Lincoln University. And she's also been a regular guest speaker in many of my classes at McGill. Welcome to the show, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. All month long, I'm interviewing people I am I have profiled in my book purposeful mm -hmm. empathy. So I'm really delighted that we are having this conversation today. Um, I find you an inspiring human being. And that's why I wrote about you, because I think your life is an expression of purposeful empathy. So thank you for being my friend. And thank you for doing the work that you do. Um, let's start with, um, with the work that Artistry Student does. Uh, for many years, you've been offering a five-day training program to women in the global South. And why don't you just take us on location somewhere so that the audience who's listening or watching can understand what this training program looks like? Yeah, so the kind of crux of the training program is this five-day boot camp, entrepreneurship boot camp. And so we could be kind of, you know, we 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 used to do this in rural areas, but we now try to do it in, in places where we can actually fit in some experiences as part of the learning process. Um, but we go, you know, we go to a location. So I'll take the, the last training we did, which was in uh, Vietnam. And we invite a number of people and, 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 and we had sort of in the pre-COVID era, we had been, you know, we had scaled to the point where we were training about 85 people a, a program. We bring in all these women, about 20% of that cohort is targeted for leadership development. So they come for a weekend full of like kind of leadership workshops and training. And then for five days, all these women, like 85 women in a training team of six or seven people are on site. Um, it's a retreat format. So women are, you know, kind of nine to nine all day, all day. And then there's an evening session till 9 p.m. And then they, you know, live together. So we're kind of together for five days. And for many women, it's transformational, not only because of the content and the approach, which is really like pushing them to build confidence in areas where they have really previously not had any. Um, it's also, and the content around like running a small business and how do you, you know, do all kinds of sort of nuts and boltsy things that you want to do when you're trying to create a revenue stream for yourself. But also, you know, for many women, it's the first time that they've been away from home. It's the first time that they've, they've been maybe, maybe in, in the city. It's the first time when they've spent any time with, with other women for any, you know, reason other than, you know, going to kind of fetch firewood or whatever. So it's really like an exciting opportunity for them to kind of build connections, build friendships and really like learn what it is to sort of be on their own. And um, so that whole, that whole package like provides like an, a super opportunity for kind of fomenting all kinds of exciting learnings and connections and things like that. And then after that training for a year, we support them. There's sort of, there's a, there's a structure within the program, which, which help, where, people who have been targeted for leadership training are also kind of facilitating ongoing work in small groups, in certain small groups that are kind of selected according to where they are in the country, where they're located. Um, yeah, and so they have like a, a year of coaching and then a year later we, it's kind of a remote coaching in a, in a structure where we provide also some coaching to the leaders who pro subsequently provide coaching to their team members. So it's kind of a peer to peer model. Um, and then a year later, we go back and find out what changed. So, Okay, so we're going to talk about impact in a second. Now, on International Women's Day for years, you usually have um, a, a gathering and a, and a fundraising campaign. But this year, you accept an invitation to come speak in my social entrepreneurship class. And I'm so grateful. And you shared the reason why this training program is needed in the first place and the kind of ripple effect impact that it has 
in a general sense. And then you also shared the story of one particular woman just to sort of bring that general sense to life. So I wonder if you could share that again. Well, you know, why do we need this in the world? Well, we, I mean, just look around. We need more women in positions of influence. And how do women get into positions of influence? Well, they have to be sort of autonomous, financially autonomous individual human beings. And that in the world we live in, for better or for worse, and I tend to think for worse, that is the, you know, that requires money that requires the ability to generate your own money and then and we see it happen all the time then women suddenly become kind of influential they they you know their value their 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 opinions are valued there was there people solicit their in so we're really trying to get women in a position where they can bring their beneficial influence and the other thing is just in the very immediate kind of term is when women generate revenue they immediately, they, they just have much more control over how those funds are spent. And women tend to prioritize like things for the household and nutrition for their families and, and education for the girl, you know? So there's, there tends to be those, there's those immediate benefits. And then there's kind of the longer, you know, influence sort of change maker type benefits. Um, and the story that, <laughs> the story I told in your class, which was, um, you know, just one, one example of a woman that kind of had a, a super, for me, moving story. Um, but there are, I mean, literally hundreds of these. Uh, it was a woman who came to our training program. She, we knew she was in a, in a relationship that involved, uh, you know, domestic abuse because we were we were told by our, our our partners who were working on the ground with these women, and and so this woman, uh, we we kind of knew that she was in that situation. And she was really a very when she came to us, she was a super cowed person, like wouldn't look you in the eye, always looking down, very like shy, and and she was, you know, I mean really like super low income, very, you know, really very, very hard, a very hard story. She came to the training and I mean, there was a point where, um, I mean, she never spoke at all and she always had, was sort of, <laughs> sort of glum and never really participated. She wasn't participating until, um, you know, like a few days into the training and we, cause we do this, we do this thing where we invite people who are particularly quiet and we invite them to like a focus group discussion once a day. We do about five or six people and we invited her and we were kind of, you know, encourage, we encourage these people who are not really talking very much. You know, we try, we try to bring to them the idea that their voices need to be heard and that we want to hear their voices. So, um, but I mean, at, at the, this woman, like just to kind of fill out the picture too, I remember one moment in the training where I was sitting at a table where the team leader, you know, was sort of helping people do an exercise, a particular exercise. I don't remember. I think it was a costing exercise. And she was holding a pencil, like all kind of crooked. And I was like, I said to my, the team leader, to, what's wrong? Like, I thought there was maybe some sort of, you know, muscular problem. I didn't know. And my team leader said, uh, no, like she's never held a pencil before in her life. She hadn't held a pencil before in her life. And she was just like kind of mimicking the, the, the numbers, you know, that our team leader was doing. Anyway, on the very last day after we'd had this conversation with her, which was, you know, her and a group, like really like, you know, we really would like to hear your voices, ladies. Like, so, you know, um, and the last day of the training, <laughs> the trainer was asking some kind of question and missed the fact that she had put up her hand so I kind of called attention to the fact that she put up her hand. So she got selected to talk. And then she, 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 she happened to be sitting at a table facing the wall. So she started talking when she was called upon to, to share her answer to whatever the question was. So she started talking, but because of the layout of the room and the way she was sitting at the table, she was talking, she was about three feet from the wall. And so she was talking to the wall. And so the class started kind of calling out, you know, like, stand up, stand up. And finally, I, I actually went over and kind of gently like lifted her up by the elbows and, um, and she, she, she started talking, but she was still talking to the wall, just standing up. And so again, everyone was like, turn around. And we kind of faced it, turned around. She was finally, you know, helped her kind of gently nudge her to face the group of 45 people or something at that time. That was our first program in Vietnam. And she was like, so she shared whatever it was, which again, was in, you know, Hmong or something. So I, I can't tell you what she said right off the top of my head, but she said something. And then the rest of the class broke into spontaneous applause because she, you know, just this big milestone. And then 
I was by this point leaning against the wall that she had been talking to previously and kind of watching the things unfold. So after she spoke and everybody clapped and, you know, it was this kind of super fun moment, she turned around and sat back down at the, at the desk, like we're at the table where she'd been sitting and cried like with her back to the group, you know, just cried for like five minutes. It was so moving, but it was, it was completely transformational. And she, you know, she, the rest of the day, she was like a, a blossomed flower. And a year later I went and I got the results from the, <laughs> the find the end of, of, of program kind of interview. And she had quadrupled her income. And, and <laughs> I was, Anyway, we went to in, I went to interview her in her tiny little hut in the middle of nowhere with the mud floor in the big mountains because it was so miraculous what had happened. And she had, you know, she had, anyway, she, I don't know if I'm jumping the gun, but she had increased her, you know, influence in the household. She had responded. There's questions, you know, she had all her major decision-making. Almost all of it was now shared between her and her husband, you know, and so things had really changed for her. And uh, it was super exciting. And she said to us, yeah, because of the training program, I realized like I was never going to actually make any money doing that thing that I had pl I was planning to do. And so I, you know, I she, basically she did kind of an analysis of the opportunities of the assets that she had. And she said, yeah, I, I started this other business and it's going well. And she, you know, and she, anyway, it was and it, it had been really transformational. So it's such a touching story. And I have heard over the years, other super touching stories of women you've met, whether it was in Latin America, South America, and India. Um, and I, I guess one of the thoughts that's percolating in my mind is, you know, there's this whole idea of sort of a white savior complex, right? Somebody goes in and does some like international development work and, you know, who do you think you are? And then there's a conflicted kind of feeling. I'm even, you know, thinking about it for myself in terms of my own trip to Rwanda, you know, you're not, what are you really going to be able to change? You're not gonna be able to change global poverty. Right. So what's, what do you, what do you think you're doing? Like what's, what audacity do you have to think that you're going to go over and like change people's lives. And then at the same time, that's what happens in some instances is that, you know, you, you, that program was transformational for her. She could, that, that's real, that's real change. And so I just wonder if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really an interesting and valid point, you know, and something that it's hard to be moving and operating in the space and not be face to face with that all the time. Um, but I mean, I, I, we have we try to we try to kind of a different approach about evaluating our impact this year. And, and the stories that keep coming back are really like this program changed how I see myself. So I, I think I think people can I think you can do something. Somebody can do something. I, I am. And, and I think another thing I just want to kind of insert here is this conversation around what it is to be an educator. What does it mean to be working in the space around education? You're, you're, I, I feel profoundly like an educator. I'm not, I'm not teaching anybody anything they don't already know. You know, it, it's something like a process of uncovering. It's something like that. And I think that, you know, we can do that in all kinds of contexts. I think if you're profoundly, you know, if you, if you get that what you're, what you're doing as an educator is, 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 is like facilitating an uncovering or, you know, maybe is, is, is a way of putting it because the people are, you know, people have the gifts that they have and they know the things that they know. And, and they, and they definitely, if they don't know it, they can easily learn it from each other, you know? So I, I feel that, so, so just for me personally, I feel like in any situation where I've been an educator, that's the, that's the moment that's like profoundly moving. And it could be in any context. It's the moment where you, and, and you do this too. It's a moment where you have somehow facilitated or catalyzed a kind of an uncovering of something that's beautiful and great. And it's like a moment where somebody has realized that they are capable. It's not that you made them capable at all. It's that, it's that you, and I think a lot, I think that's a lot what's the situation with people who don't have access to opportunities like that. It's really like somebody believed in you. And it's, I mean, if you think back to all the beautiful moments of your own life, it's like, when did somebody see you really profoundly for who you are? That's a moment that can be life-changing, you know? And so I think that's, that's a gift that anybody could bring to any situation. This happens to be the venue where we do it 
And I think really as an organization and, the, and what we bring to this space, which is about building capacity, yes, there are things that we can bring because there are things that we maybe have some understanding about that is harder or we have some knowledge about because we're subject matter experts or something. But the real gift is that it's it's kind of putting in the time and and making it the, making it open, making it available to people, making that awareness, that growth, that like investment in self, that awareness of self, self becomes possible. And I think, you know, when we work, I really feel like a lot of what we're doing is facilitating this conversation, particularly between women, you know, we're facilitating knowledge sharing, if you want to break it down to knowledge, but it's about so much more than knowledge, you know? And I, so I think when we're the most successful is when we effectively facilitate. So people are sharing what they know because most of the times they know but much better about, you know, there could be five things that I might know better or somebody <laughs> trained professional in some area might know better, but the reality is they know better. They're living in this situation. They're living, you know, they, they, they know better. So I think a lot of what we have to do if we're going to be sensitive and intelligent in the space is just accept that we don't actually know, but that the best we, but we can create a space where there is knowledge sharing, where there is like time spent. We can, we can ask provocative questions. We can, we can devote our time and energy and, and love to, to people who like, for whom that is a, is a, is an important experience, you know, and changes something for them so that something else becomes possible. And all of that, as you're speaking, has the same ethos as purposeful empathy, right? To stand with somebody, hold space with somebody on purpose, knowing that they are valuable as a human being, worthy of the same dignity and respect that we all are. Um, so that, yeah. that's, that's why I admire the work that you do. That's why I admire you. Hey, I don't mean to interrupt a great conversation. I just want to draw attention to the fact that there are over 120 equally awesome conversations of my podcast and YouTube series on my channel. Please subscribe. The world needs more empathy and you have a role to play. So now I'm going to trace your story back a bit. Mm -hmm. For the four people that I'm interviewing in April, I'm reading directly from my book and I'll ask you um, <laughs> to reflect back, like reflect on what it feels like to hear your story read to you. And then also I just maybe to think about, there might be somebody who's listening or watching that can relate to maybe something in the story and, but may not have made a shift like you will have, that you've made, which I'll read about in a second. And if there's any kind of, nudging words of provocation or advice you'd like to offer. Okay. Mm. Well, this is in the chapter, Leaning Into Purpose. Jennifer admits she's always held up her middle finger to authority. As editor of her school paper, she published many controversial pieces despite regular shutdowns by the administration. Censorship emboldened her, even prompting a solo trip to the USSR during the Cold War. I wanted to see autocracy up close and evaluate it with my own eyes, she says. As a grad student, Jennifer explored what helps and hinders social and political change, focusing on women's roles in accelerating shifts in social norms. Armed with a PhD in history, she became an expert on women's roles in society and why their collective experiences and contributions have been largely ignored across the globe. Early in her career, while working as a curator for Canada's Museum of Civilization, Jennifer went to India with a high school bestie. Over the years, she'd heard many stories about her friend's dad and his humble beginnings. What she didn't know was that later in life, he built a school in his birth village. Standing in the one-room structure with him, Jennifer was struck by four back-to-back -back thoughts. How much poverty there is in the world how arbitrary it was that she had so many advantages in life, that one person can make a difference, and finally, how little she was doing with her privilege to contribute to meaningful change. Back home, those insights waved heavily on her until a eureka moment when she realized how much she hated her life. I had a dream house with great benefits. I drove a new car and owned a three bedroom house, she said. But I also had chronic back pain and was taking medicine for ulcers. I couldn't sleep at night. I cried for no reason, sometimes three or four times a day. I was living on alcohol and antidepressants and even had suicidal thoughts. I just couldn't figure out how to hang myself. 
from the wooden rafters in my living room without distressing my dog. Thanks to a good therapist, Jennifer reflected upon what made her genuinely happy, and she discovered a deceptively simple answer. She felt joy helping others. Drawn to the idea of a boutique specialized in women's handmade crafts from the Global South, she took a small business course, wrote a business plan, found a location, and without a stitch of retail experience, signed a lease. What mattered most was that she'd found a sense of purpose. Having a North Star, however, didn't guarantee sales. And after two years in business, she was forced to close her shop, but she didn't give up. She liquidated her inventory and pivoted to entrepreneurship training for skilled artisans. Jennifer knew that if given the opportunity, women could grow their own small businesses and lift themselves out of poverty. Known as the multiplier effect, once women generate their own revenue, they prioritize their children's education, health, and nutritional needs. They assume new roles in their households and communities. Life expectancy increases while infant and maternal mortality rates drop. HIV transmission decreases and the GDPs of entire countries go up. Women's empowerment is even credited for mitigating climate change. Jennifer is now executive director of Artistry Sud, a nonprofit organization that offers virtual and on-location micro-entrepreneurship training to women in low-income countries from Bolivia to Vietnam. When asked how her life has changed since leaving her cushy, cushy government job, she says, I used to be materially comfortable, but miserable. Now I live modestly, but with a great deal of abundance. Seeing women embrace what is possible for themselves has been the biggest blessing of my life. What does that feel like to have that red back? Um, yeah, it's really um, touching. It makes, I can't cry because I have mascara on, but I mean, it's really... <laughs> but yeah it's it's um it's been a journey yeah mm. moving to think I mean for me you know I guess it's it's been a long road mm. getting here mm. and to anybody who might be listening thinking I have a sucky job or I don't feel good in my life I want to have more meaning in my life what would you say well I think I mean, people say that stuff to me all the time. So, and people ask, you know, like, this is, a. I think it's a big theme. I mean, wouldn't it be? Look at, look at the lives we lead. I mean, so, and, and I think that, I mean, the one thing is, I don't think you can, you can um, downplay the, the, I, I, I guess I was following something, you know, I felt, I knew that I, I knew that there was something, something more. I knew that, that, that this, what, this couldn't be life acquiring things, having a job, you know, I, I, I knew that couldn't be life. And I knew also that, you know, I, I think, I guess I knew on some level, I wouldn't have put it like this at the time, but I think we're, we're, I don't know. We're we're human beings having a human experience. We're here for a reason. We're here to 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 be like fully expressed. We're not. Um, and I knew because I spent all that time down in the trenches in the really terrible, you know, like the wondering how to hang myself from the rafters. Um, I, I knew there had been another time there, there was another way you know so I guess for the people it's not like um it's not like a wake up in the morning and you and you 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 know what your life's purpose is about you know I, for I mean for me it took a couple of years to figure out when to even just remember like when had I felt like I was doing the work like that was my soul's like work my soul you know the expression of what I was meant to be doing um so I guess what I would say is like, kind of, I, I don't think we're meant to be here accumulating stuff and cars and houses. And I don't think that's what we're here for. Mm -hmm. And I, like one of the things that occurred to me kind of in the light of the question around what, who do we think we are? I, I think 
you know, once you've seen something, you can't unsee it. And I think where where you're called to to create something new and or create something maybe old even, I mean, just create something that's, or to contribute or to ca help catalyze the creation of something that works be much better than what we have, like that brings something. I think we have an obligation to do it. And I think the, the question or the problem is, I, I, I mean, I, I can speak for myself, but I, I, you know, it gets, I think we're both intoxicated by, by stuff and, and, and also we don't know like it took me a long time to realize that stuff wasn't enough, you know, and, and not that, and I was not a materialistic person. It wasn't like, I was never a person who was really motivated by stuff, you know, but, but you kind of get into this like hamster wheel and you, you almost don't realize that you're, you're like, as a human being, you're meant to have some other kind of expression. So I guess what my nudge is like, um, do something like, and dare, well, it, it's really it's the it's it's the 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 motto of 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 a talk I gave of my TED talk. It's 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 really dare to care. Like go, like because it takes something to put yourself on the line, and it's scary to to actually care and to and to let go the kind of cynicism that we have that we can make any kind of difference in the world. It's not only can we make a difference. make a difference it's like you have a responsibility to make a difference and you if you have the capacity in other words if you're not starving you have a responsibility to 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 make a difference and to do look i, I mean there's just profound injustice in the world and if anything you know our privilege doesn't isn't helping to balance the scales so we, we of all people have a responsibility to, to try to make a difference. And to put a fine point on this, what, what role does empathy have to play in what you're talking about? Well, um, I think that it's probably the, the, the thing that underpins everything, right? You, 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 you I mean, if I take my, my own work as an example, I, I, and I think why do people take any kind of action? It's because they they understand, like at a profound level, that someone else is, is you know, that that another person's experience is inherently valuable. That that all that we're all we're all living creatures are inherently valuable. You know that that, that there's this, and you have a kind of empathy. I mean, um, for 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 others, or even for the, I mean, even for the planet, or for you know, there. I mean, I think it's fundamental that 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 feeling that somehow we're all maybe one or valuable or, you know, inherently worthy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so now Artist You Sued has moved in a new direction or it's, it's, it's maybe not moved, but you're really reflecting deeply on maybe the next orientation for Artist You Sued. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, yeah. And in, in some ways it's, very it's new and it will maybe seem new and look new to anybody who already has is following the organization but in many ways it's it's very similar to what we already do i mean it, i really profoundly believe that we need more women in positions of influence and that starts you know both in their own very own lives all the way up to anywhere where you know power is brokered um and i think the world would be a much better place for it so we're continuing to do that but what has become kind of clear to me, both because of sort of world circumstances over the last few years, but also, um, uh, well, that also kind of provoked a lot of kind of in-depth research. I mean, I don't, I don't want to overstate the case, but I, I've been doing a lot of research and, and reading and talking to a lot of people. Um, and I, I really feel that there's an opportunity and a necessity to to look at how we do food systems differently. And I think it's so critical. It's not, it's critical. I just want to take a step back and say that I don't understand, I'm not sure why human beings persist in dividing themselves from like the natural world. Like we talk about environment again, this is that colonization thing. We talk about environment as if it's something that we control that serves us rather than <laughs> something we're part of. But I, 
I feel like, you know, the, the, the way kind of the natural world works, including our part in it, and including like how we consume, because that's so at the moment, that's a lot of what we do on earth. Um, and I feel like there's really an opportunity to look at our own health and the health of the, of the planet as, as more sort of holistic, more in a holistic way. And I think there's an opportunity there to both improve our health, but also improve the impact that we're having on the planet. Incl like if we, by rethink, not rethinking, I mean, I, we're talking about regenerative agriculture at our street suit and organic agriculture, but really regenerative approaches. And it's not new. We didn't invent it at all. But I really feel that women play a critical role in this. And this um, is becoming, you know, kind of more and more clear. And there's other people also working in the space. And women, I think because women play such a critical role in biodiversity in rural cultures, I think there's an opportunity you know, in the work that we do to really help catalyze that change, you know, even for something as basic as improved nutrition. Um, for example, you know, in the world now there's fewer hungry people and there's plenty of food to go around, but nutrition is, is worse, is at an all time low, you know, I mean, nutrition keeps getting worse and worse. So I think there's really an opportunity by leveraging the work that women are already doing in that space and raising awareness of women of what they're doing because as usual women tend to not really value the role that they play because there doesn't seem to be cash associated with it all the time so i think there's really an opportunity to leverage women's existing influence and again like kind of use that so to the extent that the the role women play in agriculture has also a market um outlet like it's a source it can be a source of revenue um i think there's an opportunity there to to have more impact because, because we all, everybody's got to eat and everybody needs healthy food and all that kind of stuff. And we need to not like create the garbage agricultural systems that we're currently working under. Beautiful. So we're going to include in the show notes information about Artistry Sued, the website, um, Jennifer's Dare to Care TED Talk. Um, and I have a final question for you, Jennifer. And that is, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what it feels like to be on the receiving end of empathy, if there's a thought that comes to mind, and, and what it means for you to, to receive empathy. Yeah, it's really beautiful. Um, I, 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 I can think of a, a number of like little, I'm going to call empathy that like how I feel about it is like when, when I feel, when I'm on the receiving end of empathy, I really feel seen. I feel, you know, so seen and valued for the thing I'm actually doing um, or, or, and the intention that I'm bringing, you know? And um, I think it, I think it's really, it's just, it's, it's transformative. It, it, it makes things possible. It, 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 it it's energizing. It's, I, I have, um, I recently kind of reconnected with my youngest sister who for several reasons I hadn't spoken to uh, or well, I wasn't close to for a long time and one of them is that she's much younger than I am um and we kind of we sort of started re reconnecting recently but I, I but and and we and we're we're doing a lot of co-working together because we we we're actually working on sort of similar themes but in in different spaces and I I, I I was thinking about, you know, when you, you asked that question and I was thinking like, it's, it's, it's an, it's kind of an ongoing, it's not one thing, but it's an ongoing, like kind of feeling like that feeling of empathy, like that feeling that some, you know, I'm seen for who I am and what I'm actually, that what I'm doing is, is, is inherently valuable and worthy. And it's just, it's, it's so, it's, um it's, it's energizing. It's like a relief almost, you know, it's like coming home. So it's not about, let's buy another pair of stiletto heels. Let's be in the company of somebody who really sees you. Oh man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a really sweet way to end this conversation, Jen. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for the work you do. Thank you all for watching and listening. We'll see you next week at Purposeful. Thanks so much for watching another episode of Purposeful Empathy. Please subscribe to my channel. Please consider buying a copy of Purposeful Empathy. Remember, 
The world needs more empathy and you have a role to play. Thank you.